Chapter One Treats of the place where Oliver Twist was born, and of the circumstances attending his birth. Among other public buildings in a certain town, which for many reasons it would be prudent to refrain from mentioning, and to which I will assign no fictitious name, there was one anciently common to most towns, great or small, to wit a workhouse. And in this workhouse was born, on a day and date which I need not trouble myself to repeat, inasmuch as it can be of no possible consequence to the reader at this stage of the business at all events, the item of mortality whose name is prefixed to the head of this chapter. For a long time after it was ushered into this world of sorrow and trouble by the parish surgeon, it remained a matter of considerable doubt whether the child would survive to bear any name at all, in which case it is somewhat more than probable that these memoirs would never have appeared, or, if they had, that being comprised within a couple of pages, they would have possessed the inestimable merit of being the most concise and faithful specimen of biography extant in the literature of any age or country. Although I am not disposed to maintain that the being born in a workhouse is in itself the most fortunate and enviable circumstance that can possibly befall a human being, I do mean to say that in this particular instance it was the best thing for Oliver Twist that could by possibility have occurred. The fact is that there was considerable difficulty in inducing Oliver to take upon himself the office of respiration, a troublesome practice, but one which custom has rendered necessary to our easy existence and for some time he lay gasping on a little flock mattress rather unequally poised between this world and the next, the balance being decidedly in favour of the latter. Now if during this brief period Oliver had been surrounded by careful grandmothers, anxious aunts, experienced nurses, and doctors of profound wisdom, he would most inevitably and indubitably have been killed in no time. There being nobody by, however, but a pauper old woman, who was rendered rather misty by an unwonted allowance of beer, and a parish surgeon who did such matters by contract, Oliver and nature fought out the point between them. The result was that after a few struggles Oliver breathed, sneezed, and proceeded to advertise to the inmates of the workhouse the fact of a new burden having been imposed upon the parish, by setting up as loud a cry as could reasonably have been expected from a male infant who had not been possessed of that very useful appendage, a voice, for a much longer space of time than three minutes and a quarter. As Oliver gave this first proof of the free and proper action of his lungs, the patchwork coverlet which was carelessly flung over the iron bedstead rustled, the pale face of a young woman was raised feebly from the pillow, and a faint voice imperfectly articulated the words, "'Let me see the child, and die.' The surgeon had been sitting with his face turned towards the fire, giving the palms of his hands a warm and a rub alternately. As the young woman spoke, he rose, and, advancing to the bed's head, said with more kindness than might have been expected of him, "'Oh, you must not talk about dying yet.' "'Lord bless her dear heart, no,' interposed the nurse, hastily depositing in her pocket a green glass bottle, the contents of which she had been tasting in a corner with evident satisfaction. Oh, Lord bless her dear heart, when she has lived as long as I have, sir, and had thirteen children of her own, and all in and dead except two, and them in the workers with me, she'll know better than to take on in that way. Bless her dear heart. Think what it is to be a mother, there's a dear young lamb, do. Apparently this consolatory perspective of a mother's prospects failed in producing its due effect. The patient shook her head and stretched out her hand towards the child. The surgeon deposited it in her arms, she imprinted her cold, white lips passionately on its forehead, passed her hands over her face, gazed wildly round, shuddered, fell back, and died. They chafed her breast, hands, and temples, but the blood had stopped for ever. They talked of hope and comfort. They had been strangers too long. "'It's all over, Mrs. Thingamy,' said the surgeon at last. "'Ah, poor dear, so tis,' said the nurse, picking up the cork of the green bottle, which had fallen out on the pillow as she stooped to take up the child. "'Poor dear!' "'You needn't mind sending up to me if the child cries, nurse,' said the surgeon, putting on his gloves with great deliberation. "'It's very likely it will be troublesome. Give it a little gruel if it is.' He put on his hat, and, pausing by the bedside on his way to the door, added, "'She was a good-looking girl, too. Where did she come from?' 
she was brought here last night replied the old woman by the overseer's order she was found lying in the street she had walked some distance for her shoes were worn to pieces but where she came from or where she was going to nobody knows the surgeon leaned over the body and raised the left hand the old story he said shaking his head no wedding ring i see ah good night the medical gentleman walked away to dinner and the nurse having once more applied herself to the green bottle sat down on a low chair before the fire and proceeded to dress the infant what an excellent example of the power of dress young oliver twist was wrapped in the blanket which had hitherto formed his only covering he might have been the child of a nobleman or a beggar it would have been hard for the haughtiest stranger to have assigned him his proper station in society but now that he was enveloped in the old calico robes which had grown yellow in the same service he was badged and ticketed and fell into his place at once a parish child the orphan of a workhouse the humble half-starved drudge to be cuffed and buffeted through the world despised by all and pitied by none oliver cried lustily if he could have known that he was an orphan left to the tender mercies of church wardens and overseers perhaps he would have cried the louder end of chapter 1 treats of oliver twist's growth education and board for the next eight or ten months Oliver was the victim of a systematic course of treachery and deception. He was brought up by hand. The hungry and destitute situation of the infant orphan was duly reported by the workhouse authorities to the parish authorities. The parish authorities inquired with dignity of the workhouse authorities whether there was no female then domiciled in the house who was in a situation to impart to Oliver Twist the consolation and nourishment of which he stood in need the workhouse authorities replied with humility that there was not upon this the parish authorities magnanimously and humanely resolved that oliver should be farmed or in other words that he should be dispatched to a branch workhouse some three miles off where twenty or thirty other juvenile offenders against the poor laws rolled about the floor all day without the inconvenience of too much food or too much clothing under the parental superintendence of an elderly female who received the culprits at and for the consideration of sevenpence halfpenny per small head per week. Sevenpence halfpenny's worth per week is a good round diet for a child. A great deal may be got for sevenpence halfpenny, quite enough to overload its stomach and make it uncomfortable. The elderly female was a woman of wisdom and experience. She knew what was good for children, and she had a very accurate perception of what was good for herself. So she appropriated the greater part of the weekly stipend to her own use, and consigned the rising parochial generation to even a shorter allowance than was originally provided for them, thereby finding in the lowest depth a deeper still, and proving herself a very great experimental philosopher. Everybody knows the story of another experimental philosopher who had a great theory about a horse being able to live without eating, and who demonstrated it so well that he had got his own horse down to a straw a day and would unquestionably have rendered him a very spirited and rampacious animal on nothing at all if he had not died four and twenty hours before he was to have had his first comfortable bait of air. Unfortunately for the experimental philosophy of the female to whose protecting care Oliver Twist was delivered over, a similar result usually attended the operation of her system, for at the very moment when the child had contrived to exist upon the smallest possible portion of the weakest possible food, it did perversely happen in eight and a half cases out of ten, either that it sickened from want and cold, or fell into the fire from neglect, or got half smothered by accident, in any one of which cases the miserable little being was usually summoned into another world, and there gathered to the father it had never known in this. Occasionally, when there was some more than usually interesting inquest upon a parish child who had been overlooked in turning up a bedstead, or inadvertently scalded to death when there happened to be a washing, though the latter accident was very scarce, anything approaching to a washing being of rare occurrence in the farm, the jury would take it into their heads to ask troublesome questions, or the parishioners would rebelliously affix their signatures to a remonstrance. But these impertinences were speedily checked by the evidence of the surgeon and the testimony of the beadle, the former of whom had always opened the body and found nothing inside, which was very probable indeed, 
and the latter of whom invariably swore whatever the parish wanted, which was very self-devotional. Besides, the board made periodical pilgrimages to the farm, and always sent the beadle the day before to say they were going. The children were neat and clean to behold when they went, and what more would the people have? It cannot be expected that this system of farming would produce any very extraordinary or luxuriant crop. Oliver Twist's ninth birthday found him a pale, thin child, somewhat diminutive in stature and decidedly small in circumference. But nature or inheritance had implanted a good sturdy spirit in Oliver's breast. It had had plenty of room to expand, thanks to the spare diet of the establishment and perhaps to this circumstance may be attributed his having any ninth birthday at all. Be this as it may, however, it was his ninth birthday, and he was keeping it in the coal cellar with a select party of two other young gentlemen, who, after participating with him in a sound thrashing, had been locked up for atrociously presuming to be hungry, when Mrs. Mann, the good lady of the house, was unexpectedly startled by the apparition of Mr. Bumble the beadle, striving to undo the wicket of the garden gate. "'Goodness gracious, is that you, Mr. Bumble, sir?' said Mrs. Mann, thrusting her head out of the window in well-affected ecstasies of joy. "'Susan, take Oliver and them two brats upstairs and wash them directly. Oh, my heart alive, Mr. Bumble, how glad I am to see you! Surely!' Now, Mr. Bumble was a fat man and a choleric, so instead of responding to this open-hearted salutation in a kindred spirit, he gave the little wicket a tremendous shake and then bestowed upon it a kick which could have emanated from no leg but a beadle's. "'Law, only think,' said Mrs. Mann, running out, for the three boys had been removed by this time, "'only think of that, that I should have forgotten that the gate was bolted on the inside on account of them dear children. Walk in, sir, walk in, pray, Mr. Bumble, do, sir.' Although this invitation was accompanied with a curtsey that might have softened the heart of a churchwarden, it by no means mollified the beadle. "'Do you think this respectful or proper conduct, Mrs. Mann?' inquired Mr. Bumble, grasping his cane, "'to keep the parish officers awaiting at your garden gate, when they come here upon parochial business with the parochial orphans? Are you aware, Mrs. Mann, that you are, as I may say, a parochial delegate and a state pendery?' "'I am sure, Mr. Bumble, that I was only telling one or two of the dear children as is so fond of you that it was you a coming," replied Mrs. Mann, with great humility. Mr. Bumble had a great idea of his oratorical powers and his importance. He had displayed the one and vindicated the other. He relaxed. "'Well, well, Mrs. Mann,' he replied in a calmer tone, "'it may be as you say, it may be. Lead the way in, Mrs. Mann, for I come on business, and have something to say.' Mrs. Mann ushered the beadle into a small parlour with a brick floor, placed a seat for him, and officiously deposited his cocked hat and cane on the table before him. Mr. Bumble wiped from his forehead the perspiration which his walk had engendered, glanced complacently at the cocked hat, and smiled. Yes, he smiled. Beetles are but men, and Mr. Bumble smiled. "'Now don't you be offended at what I'm going to say,' observed Mrs. Mann, with captivating sweetness. "'You've had a long walk, you know, and I wouldn't mention it. Now, will you take a little drop of something, Mr. Bumble?' "'Not a drop. Not a drop.' said Mr. Bumble, waving his right hand in a dignified but placid manner. "'I think you will,' said Mrs. Mann, who had noticed the tone of the refusal and the gesture that had accompanied it. "'Just a little drop, with a little cold water, and a lump of sugar?' Mr. Bumble coughed. "'And now just a little drop,' said Mrs. Mann persuasively. "'What is it?' inquired the beadle. "'Why, it's what I'm obliged to keep a little of in the house, to put into the blessed infant's daffy when they ain't well, Mr. Bumble,' replied Mrs. Mann, as she opened a corner cupboard, and took down a bottle and glass. "'It's gin. I'll not deceive you, Mr. B. It's gin.' "'Do you give the children daffy, Mrs. Mann?' inquired Bumble, following with his eyes the interesting process of mixing. "'Ah, bless him, that I do, dear as it is.' replied the nurse. I couldn't see him suffer before my very eyes, you know, sir. Oh, no, said Mr. Bumble approvingly. No, you could not. You are a humane woman, Mrs. Mann. Here she set down the glass. I shall take an early opportunity of mentioning it to the board, Mrs. Mann. He drew it towards him. You feel as a mother, Mrs. Mann. He stirred the gin and water. Thy, thy drink your health with cheerfulness, Mrs. Mann.' 
and he swallowed half of it. "'And now about business,' said the beadle, taking out a leathern pocket-book. "'The child of his half-baptized Oliver Twist is nine year old to-day.' "'Bless him!' interposed Mrs. Mann, inflaming her left eye with a corner of her apron. And notwithstanding an offered reward of ten pound, which was afterwards increased to twenty pound, notwithstanding the most superlative and, on my say, supernatural exertions on the part of this parish, said Bumble, we have never been able to discover who was his father or what was his mother's settlement name or condition. Mrs. Mann raised her hands in astonishment, but added after a few moments' reflection, How comes he to have any name at all, then? The beadle drew himself up with great pride and said, I invented it. You, Mr. Bumble? I, Mrs. Mann. We name our fondlings in alphabetical order. The last was a S. A swubble I named him. This was a T. Twist I named him. The next one as comes will be Unwin, and the next Vilkins. I've got names ready made to the end of the alphabet, and all the way through it again, when we come to Z. Why, you are quite a literary character, sir said Mrs. Mann. "'Well, yeah, well,' said the beadle, evidently gratified with the compliment. "'Perhaps I may be. Perhaps I may be, Mrs. Mann.' He finished the gin and water, and added, "'Oliver, being now too old to remain here, the board have determined to take him back into the house. I have come out myself to take him there, so let me see him at once.' "'I'll fetch him directly,' said Mrs. Mann, leaving the room for that purpose. Oliver, having had by this time as much of the outer coat of dirt which encrusted his face and hands removed, as could be scrubbed off in one washing, was led into the room by his benevolent protectress. "'Make a bow to the gentleman, Oliver,' said Mrs. Mann. Oliver made a bow, which was divided between the beadle on the chair and the cocked hat on the table. And "'Will you go along with me, Oliver?' said Mr. Bumble, in a majestic voice. Oliver was about to say that he would go along with anybody with great readiness, when, glancing upward, he caught sight of Mrs. Mann, who had got behind the beadle's chair, and was shaking her fist at him with a furious countenance. He took the hint at once, for the fist had been too often impressed upon his body, not to be deeply impressed upon his recollection. "'Will she go with me?' inquired poor Oliver. "'No, she can't,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'But she'll come and see you sometimes.' This was no very great consolation to the child. Young as he was, however, he had sense enough to make a feint of feeling great regret at going away. It was no very great difficult matter for the boy to call tears into his eyes. Hunger and recent ill-usage are great assistance if you want to cry. And Oliver cried very naturally indeed. Mrs. Mann gave him a thousand embraces, and what Oliver wanted a great deal more, a piece of bread and butter lest he should seem too hungry when he got to the workhouse. With the slice of bread in his hand, and the little brown-cloth parish cap on his head, Oliver was then led away by Mr. Bumble from the wretched home where one kind word or look had never lighted the gloom of his infant years. And yet he burst into an agony of childish grief as the cottage gate closed after him. Wretched as were the little companions in misery he was leaving behind, they were the only friends he had ever known and a sense of his loneliness in the great wide world sank into the child's heart for the first time. Mr. Bumble walked on with long strides. Little Oliver, firmly grasping his gold-laced cuff, trotted beside him, inquiring at the end of every quarter of a mile whether they were nearly there. To these interrogations Mr. Bumble returned very brief and snappish replies for the temporary blandness which gin and water awakens in some bosoms had by this time evaporated and he was once again a beadle. Oliver had not been within the walls of the workhouse a quarter of an hour, and had scarcely completed the demolition of a second slice of bread, when Mr. Bumble, who had handed him over to the care of an old woman, returned, and, telling him it was a board night, informed him that the board had said he was to appear before it forthwith. Not having a very clearly defined notion of what a live board was, Oliver was rather astounded by this intelligence and was not quite certain whether he ought to laugh or cry. He had no time to think about the matter, however, for Mr. Bumble gave him a tap on the head with his cane to wake him up, and another on the back to make him lively, and, bidding him to follow, conducted him into a large whitewashed room, where eight or ten fat gentlemen were sitting round a table, 
At the top of the table, seated in an armchair rather higher than the rest, was a particularly fat gentleman with a very round red face. "'Bow to the board,' said Bumble. Oliver brushed away two or three tears that were lingering in his eyes, and seeing no board but the table, fortunately bowed to that. "'What's your name, boy?' said the gentleman in the high chair. Oliver was frightened at the sight of so many gentlemen, which made him tremble, and the beadle gave him another tap behind, which made him cry. These two causes made him answer in a very low and hesitating voice, whereupon a gentleman in a white waistcoat said he was a fool, which was a capital way of raising his spirits and putting him quite at his ease. "'Boy,' said the gentleman in the high chair, "'may listen to me. You know you're an orphan, I suppose.' "'What's that, sir?' inquired poor Oliver. "'The boy is a fool. I thought he was,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Hush!' said the gentleman who had spoken first. "'You know you've got no father or mother, and that you were brought up by the parish, don't you?' "'Yes, sir,' replied Oliver, weeping bitterly. "'What are you crying for?' inquired the gentleman in the white waistcoat. And to be sure, it was very extraordinary. What could the boy be crying for?' "'I hope you say your prayers every night,' said another gentleman in a gruff voice, "'and pray for the people to feed you and take care of you like a Christian.' "'Yes, sir,' stammered the boy. The gentleman who spoke last was unconsciously right. It would have been very like a Christian, and a marvellously good Christian, too, if Oliver had prayed for the people who fed and took care of him. But he hadn't, because nobody had taught him. "'Well, you have come here to be educated and taught a useful trade.' said the red-faced gentleman in the high chair. "'So you'll begin to pick oakum to-morrow morning at six o'clock,' added the surly one in the white waistcoat. For the combination of both these blessings, in the one simple process of picking oakum, Oliver bowed low by the direction of the beadle, and was then hurried away to a large ward where, on a rough, hard bed, he sobbed himself to sleep. What a noble illustration of the tender laws of England! They let the paupers go to sleep. Poor Oliver! He little thought, as he lay sleeping in happy unconsciousness of all around him, that the board had that very day arrived at a decision which would exercise the most material influence over all his future fortunes. But they had, and this was it. The members of this board were very sage, deep, philosophical men, and when it came to turn their attention to the workhouse, they found out at once what ordinary folks would never have discovered. The poor people liked it. It was a regular place of public entertainment for the poorer classes, a tavern where there was nothing to pay, a public breakfast, dinner, tea and supper all the year round, a brick-and-mortar elysium, where it was all play and no work. The ho said the board, looking very knowing, we are the fellows to set this to rights. We'll stop it all in no time. So they established the rule that all poor people should have the alternative, for they would compel nobody, not they of being starved by a gradual process in the house, or by a quick one out of it. With this view they contracted with the waterworks to lay on an unlimited supply of water, and with a corn factor to supply periodically small quantities of oatmeal, and issue three meals of thin gruel a day, with an onion twice a week, and half a roll on Sundays. They made a great many other wise and humane regulations, having reference to the ladies, which it is not necessary to repeat kindly undertook to divorce poor married people, in consequence of the great expense of a suit in doctors' commons, and instead of compelling a man to support his family as he had theretofore done, took his family away from him and made him a bachelor. There is no saying how many applicants for relief under these last two heads might have started up in all classes of society, if it had not been coupled with the workhouse. But the board were long-headed men and had provided for this difficulty. The relief was inseparable from the workhouse and the gruel, and that frightened people. For the first six months after Oliver Twist was removed, the system was in full operation. It was rather expensive at first, in consequence of the increase in the undertaker's bill, and the necessity of taking in the clothes of all the paupers, which fluttered loosely on their wasted, shrunken forms, after a week or two's gruel. But the number of workhouse inmates got thin as well as the paupers, and the board were in ecstasies. The room in which the boys were fed was a large stone hall, with a copper at one end, 
out of which the master, dressed in an apron for the purpose, and assisted by one or two women, ladled the gruel at meal-times. Of this festive composition each boy had one porringer and no more, except on occasions of great public rejoicing, when he had two ounces and a quarter of bread besides. The bowls never wanted washing. The boys polished them with their spoons till they shone again, and when they had performed this operation, which never took very long, the spoons being nearly as large as the bowls, they would sit staring at the copper with such eager eyes as if they could have devoured the very bricks of which it was composed, employing themselves, meanwhile, in sucking their fingers most assiduously with a view of catching up any stray splashes of gruel that might have been cast thereon. Boys have generally excellent appetites. Oliver Twist and his companions suffered the tortures of slow starvation for three months. At last they got so voracious and wild with hunger that one boy, who was tall for his age and hadn't been used to that sort of thing, for his father had kept a small cook-shop, hinted darkly to his companions that unless he had another basin of gruel per diem, he was afraid he might some night happen to eat the boy who slept next him, who happened to be a weakly youth of tender age. He had a wild, hungry eye, and they implicitly believed him. A council was held. Lots were cast who should walk up to the master after supper that evening and ask for more, and it fell to Oliver Twist. The evening arrived, the boys took their places, the master, in his cook's uniform, stationed himself at the copper, his pauper assistants ranged themselves behind him. The gruel was served out, and a long grace was said over the short commons. The gruel disappeared. The boys whispered each other, and winked at Oliver, while his next neighbours nudged him. Child as he was, he was desperate with hunger, and reckless with misery. He rose from the table, and advancing to the master, basin and spoon in hand, said, somewhat alarmed at his own temerity, "'Please, sir, I want some more.' The master was a fat, healthy man, but he turned very pale. He gazed in stupefied astonishment on the small rebel for some seconds, and then clung for support to the copper. The assistants were paralysed with wonder, the boys with fear. "'What?' said the master at length in a faint voice. "'Please, sir,' replied Oliver, "'I want some more.' The master aimed a blow at Oliver's head with a ladle, pinioned him in his arm, and shrieked aloud for the beadle. The board were sitting in solemn conclave when Mr. Bumble rushed into the room in great excitement, and, addressing the gentleman in the high chair, said, uh, "'Mr. Limpkins, I beg your pardon, sir. Oliver Twist has asked for more.' There was a general start. Horror was depicted on every countenance. "'For more,' said Mr. Limpkins, "'may compose yourself, Bumble, and answer me distinctly. Do I understand that he asked for more after he had eaten the supper allotted by the dietary?' "'He did, sir,' replied Bumble. "'That boy will be hung,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'I know that boy will be hung.' Nobody controverted the prophetic gentleman's opinion. An animated discussion took place. Oliver was ordered into instant confinement, and a bill was next morning pasted on the outside of the gate, offering a reward of five pounds to anybody who would take Oliver Twist off the hands of the parish. In other words, five pounds and Oliver Twist were offered to any man or woman who wanted an apprentice to any trade, business, or calling. "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat, as he knocked at the gate and read the bill next morning. "'I never was more convinced of anything in my life than I am that that boy will come to be hung.' As I propose to show in the sequel whether the white waistcoated gentleman was right or not, I shall perhaps mar the interest of this narrative supposing it to possess any at all, if I venture to hint just yet whether the life of Oliver Twist had this violent termination or no. End of chapter 2 Relates how Oliver Twist was very near getting a place which would not have been a sinecure. For a week after the commission of the impious and profane offence of asking for more, Oliver remained a close prisoner in the dark and solitary room to which he had been consigned by the wisdom and mercy of the board. It appears at first sight not unreasonable to suppose that, if he had entertained a becoming feeling of respect for the prediction of the gentleman in the white waistcoat, he would have established that sage individual's prophetic character once and for ever by tying one end of his pocket-handkerchief to a hook in the wall and attaching himself to the other. To the performance of this feat, however, there was one obstacle. 
namely that pocket-handkerchiefs being decided articles of luxury had been for all future times and ages removed from the noses of paupers by the express order of the board in council assembled solemnly given and pronounced under their hands and seals there was a still greater obstacle in oliver's youth and childishness he only cried bitterly all day and when the long dismal night came on spread his little hands before his eyes to shut out the darkness and crouching in the corner tried to sleep ever and anon waking with a start and tremble and drawing himself closer and closer to the wall as if to feel even its cold hard surface were a protection in the gloom and loneliness which surrounded him let it not be supposed by the enemies of the system that during the period of his solitary incarceration oliver was denied the benefit of exercise the pleasure of society or the advantages of religious consolation as for exercise it was nice cold weather and he was allowed to perform his ablutions every morning under the pump in a stone yard in the presence of mr bumble who prevented his catching cold and caused a tingling sensation to pervade his frame by repeated applications of the cane as for society he was carried every other day into the hall where the boys dined and there sociably flogged as a public warning and example and so far from being denied the advantages of religious consolation he was kicked into the same apartment every evening at prayer-time and there permitted to listen to and console his mind with a general supplication of the boys containing a special clause therein inserted by authority of the board in which they entreated to be made good virtuous contented and obedient and to be guarded from the sins and vices of oliver twist whom the supplication distinctly set forth to be under the exclusive patronage and protection of the powers of wickedness and an article direct from the manufactory of the very devil himself it chanced one morning while oliver's affairs were in this auspicious and comfortable state that mr gamfield chimney-sweep went his way down the high street deeply cogitating in his mind his ways and means of paying certain arrears of rent for which his landlord had become rather pressing mr gamfield's most sanguine estimate of his finances could not raise them within full five pounds of the desired amount and in a species of arithmetical desperation he was alternately cudgelling his brains and his donkey when passing the workhouse his eyes encountered the bill on the gate Whoa, said mr gamfield to the donkey the donkey was in a state of profound abstraction wondering probably whether he was destined to be regaled with a cabbage stalk or two when he had disposed of the two sacks of soot with which the little cart was laden so without noticing a word of command he jogged onward mr gamfield growled a fierce imprecation on the donkey generally but more particularly on his eyes and running after him bestowed a blow on his head which would inevitably have beaten in any skull but a donkey's then catching hold of the bridle he gave his jaw a sharp wrench by way of gentle reminder that he was not his own master and by these means turned him round he then gave him another blow on the head just to stun him till he came back again having completed these arrangements he walked up to the gate to read the bill the gentleman with the white waistcoat was standing at the gate with his hands behind him after having delivered himself of some profound sentiments in the board-room having witnessed the little dispute between mr gamfield and the donkey he smiled joyously when that person came up to read the bill for he saw at once that mr gamfield was exactly the sort of master oliver twist wanted mr gamfield smiled too as he perused the document for five pounds was just the sum he had been wishing for and as to the boy with which it was encumbered mr gamfield knowing what the dietary of the workhouse was well knew he would be a nice small pattern just the very thing for register stoves so he spelt the bill through again from beginning to end and then touching his fur cap in token of humility accosted the gentleman in the white waistcoat this here boy sir what the parish wants to prentice said mr gamfield nay my man said the gentleman in the white waistcoat with a condescending smile what of him if the parish would like him to learn a right pleasant trade in a good spectable chimbley sweeping business said mr gamfield i want a prentice and i am ready to take him walk in said the gentleman in the white waistcoat mr gamfield having lingered behind to give the donkey another blow on the head and another wrench of the jaw as a caution not to run away in his absence followed the gentleman with the white waistcoat into the room where oliver had first seen him 
"'It's a nasty trade,' said Mr. Limpkins, when Gamfield had again stated his wish. "'Young boys have been smothered in chimneys before now,' said another gentleman. "'That's because they damped the straw afore they lit it in the chimney, to make them come down again,' said Gamfield. "'That's old smoke and no blaze. Whereas smoke ain't no use at all in making a boy come down, for it only sends him to sleep, and that's what he likes. Boys is very obstinate and very lazy, gentlemen. And there's nothing like a good up blaze to make him come down with a run. It's humane too, gentlemen, cause even if they're stuck in the chimbley, roasting their feet makes them struggle to extricate theirselves. The gentleman in the white waistcoat appeared very much amused by this explanation, but his mirth was speedily checked by a look from Mr. Limpkins. The board then proceeded to converse among themselves for a few minutes, but in so low a tone that the words, saving of expenditure, who looked well in the accounts, have a printed report published, were alone audible. These only chanced to be heard, indeed, on account of their being very frequently repeated with great emphasis. At length the whispering ceased, and the members of the board, having resumed their seats and their solemnity, Mr. Limpkin said, "'We have considered your proposition, and we don't approve of it.' Uh, "'Not at all,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'Decidedly not,' added the other members. As Mr. Gamfield did happen to labour under the slight imputation of having bruised three or four boys to death already, it occurred to him that the board had perhaps, in some unaccountable freak, taken it into their heads that this extraneous circumstance ought to influence their proceedings. It was very unlike their general mode of doing business, if they had, but still, as he had no particular wish to revive the rumour, he twisted his cap in his hands and walked slowly from the table. So you won't let me have him, gentlemen," said Mr. Gamfield, pausing near the door. "No," replied Mr. Limpkins. "At least, as it's a nasty business, we think you ought to take something less than the premium we offered." Mr. Gamfield's countenance brightened as, with a quick step, he returned to the table and said, "What'll you give, gentlemen? Come, don't be too hard on a poor man. What'll you give?" "I should say three pounds ten was plenty," said Mr. Limpkins. Ten shillings too much, said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. Come, said Gamfield, say four pound, gentlemen, say four pound, and you got rid of them for good and all, there. Three pounds ten, repeated Mr. Limpkins firmly. Come, I'll split the difference, gentlemen, urged Gamfield. Three pound fifteen. Not a farthing more, was the firm reply of Mr. Limpkins. "'You're desperate hard upon me, gentlemen,' said Gamfield, wavering. "'Pooh, pooh, nonsense,' said the gentleman in the white waistcoat. "'He'd be cheap with nothing at all as a premium. Take him, you silly fellow. He's just the boy for you. He wants to stick now and then. It'll do him good. And his board needn't come very expensive, for he hasn't been overfed since he was born.' Mr. Gamfield gave an arch look at the faces round the table, and, observing a smile on all of them, gradually broke into a smile himself. The bargain was made. Mr. Bumble was at once instructed that Oliver Twist and his indentures were to be conveyed before the magistrate for signature and approval that very afternoon. In pursuance of this determination, little Oliver, to his excessive astonishment, was released from bondage and ordered to put himself into a clean shirt. He had hardly achieved this very unusual gymnastic performance when Mr. Bumble brought him, with his own hands, a basin of gruel, and the holiday allowance of two ounces and a quarter of bread. At this tremendous sight Oliver began to cry very piteously, thinking not unnaturally that the board must have determined to kill him for some useful purpose, or they never would have begun to fatten him up in that way. "'Don't make your eyes red, Oliver, but eat your food and be thankful.' said Mr. Bumble, in a tone of impressive pomposity. "'You're a-going to be made apprentice of, Oliver.' "'Apprentice, sir?' said the child, trembling. "'Yes, Oliver,' said Mr. Bumble. "'The kind and blessed gentleman which is so many parents to you, Oliver, when you have none of your own, are going to apprentice you, and set you up in life, and make a man of you, although the expense to the parish is three pound ten. Three pound ten, Oliver!' seventy shillings one hundred and forty sixpences and all for a naughty orphan which nobody can't love as mr bumble paused to take a breath after delivering this address in an awful voice the tears rolled down the poor child's face and he sobbed bitterly come 
said Mr. Bumble, somewhat less pompously, for it was gratifying to his feelings to observe the effect his eloquence had produced. "'Come, Oliver, wipe your eyes with the cuffs of your jacket, and don't dry into your gruel. That's a very foolish action, Oliver.' It certainly was, for there was quite enough water in it already. On their way to the magistrate, Mr. Bumble instructed Oliver that all he would have to do would be to look very happy, and say when the gentleman asked him if he wanted to be apprenticed that he should like it very much indeed, both of which injunctions Oliver promised to obey, the rather as Mr. Bumble threw in a gentle hint that if he failed in either particular there was no telling what would be done to him. When they arrived at the office he was shut up in a little room by himself, and admonished by Mr. Bumble to stay there until he came back to fetch him. There the boy remained, with a palpitating heart for half an hour, at the expiration of which time Mr. Bumble thrust in his head, unadorned with a cocked hat, and said aloud, and "'Now, Oliver, my dear, come to the gentleman.' As Mr. Bumble said this he put on a grim and threatening look, and added in a low voice, and "'Mind what I told you, you young rascal. Oliver stared innocently in Mr. Bumble's face at this somewhat contradictory style of address, but that gentleman prevented his offering any remark thereupon by leading him at once into an adjoining room, the door of which was open. It was a large room with a great window. Behind a desk sat two old gentlemen with powdered heads, one of whom was reading the newspaper while the other was perusing, with the aid of a pair of tortoiseshell spectacles, a small piece of parchment which lay before him. Mr. Limpkins was standing in front of the desk on one side, and Mr. Gamfield with a partially washed face on the other, while two or three bluff-looking men in top-boots were lounging about. The old gentleman with the spectacles gradually dozed off over the little bit of parchment, and there was a short pause after Oliver had been stationed by Mr. Bumble in front of the desk. "'This is the boy, Your Worship,' said Mr. Bumble. The old gentleman who was reading the newspaper raised his head for a moment and pulled the other old gentleman by the sleeve, whereupon the last-mentioned old gentleman woke up. "'Oh, is this the boy?' said the old gentleman. Uh, "'This is him, sir,' replied Mr. Bumble. "'Bow to the magistrate, my dear.' Oliver roused himself and made his best obeisance. He had been wondering, with his eyes fixed on the magistrate's powder, whether all boards were born with that white stuff on their heads, and were boards from thenceforth on that account. "'Well,' said the old gentleman, "'I suppose he's fond of chimney-sweeping?' "'He doubts on it, Your Worship,' replied Bumble, giving Oliver a sly pinch to intimate that he had better not say he didn't. "'And he will be asleep, will he?' inquired the old gentleman. "'If we was to bind him to any other trade to-morrow we'd run away simultaneous, Your Worship,' replied Bumble. "'And this man that's to be his master, who you, sir?' "'You'll treat him well, and feed him, and do all that sort of thing, will you?' said the old gentleman. "'When I says I will, or means I will,' replied Mr. Gamfield, doggedly. "'Well, you're a rough speaker, my friend, but you look an honest, open-hearted man,' said the old gentleman, turning his spectacles in the direction of the candidate for Oliver's premium, whose villainous countenance was a regular stamped receipt for cruelty. But the magistrate was half blind and half childish, so he couldn't reasonably be expected to discern what other people did. "'I hope I am, sir,' said Mr. Gamfield, with an ugly leer. "'I have no doubt you are, my friend,' replied the old gentleman, fixing his spectacles more firmly on his nose and looking about him for the inkstand. It was the critical moment of Oliver's fate. If the inkstand had been where the old gentleman thought it was, he would have dipped his pen into it and signed the indentures, and Oliver would have been straightway hurried off. But as it chanced to be immediately under his nose it followed as a matter of course that he looked all over his desk for it without finding it, and happening in the course of his search to look straight before him, his gaze encountered the pale and terrified face of Oliver Twist, who, despite all the admonitory looks and pinches of Bumble, was regarding the repulsive countenance of his future master with a mingled expression of horror and fear, too palpable to be mistaken even by a half-blind magistrate. The old gentleman stopped, laid down his pen, and looked from Oliver to Mr. Limpkins, who attempted to take snuff with a cheerful and unconcerned aspect. "'My boy,' said the old gentleman, leaning over his desk. Oliver started at the sound. He might be excused for doing so, for the words were kindly said, and strange sounds frighten one. 
he trembled violently and burst into tears. "'My boy,' said the old gentleman, "'you look pale and alarmed. What is the matter?' "'Stand a little away from him, Beadle,' said the other magistrate, laying aside the paper and leaning forward with an expression of interest. "'Now, boy, tell us what is the matter. Don't be afraid.' Oliver fell on his knees, and, clasping his hands together, prayed that they would order him back to the dark room, that they would starve him, beat him, kill him if they pleased, rather than send him away with that dreadful man. "'Well,' said Mr. Bumble, raising his hands and eyes with most impressive solemnity, "'well, of all the artful and designing orphans that ever I see, Oliver, you are one of the most barefacedest.' "'Hold your tongue, Beadle said the second old gentleman, when Mr. Bumble had given vent to this compound adjective. "'I beg your worship's pardon,' said Mr. Bumble, incredulous of having heard right. Or "'Did your worship speak to me?' "'Yes. Hold your tongue.' Mr. Bumble was stupefied with astonishment. A beadle ordered to hold his tongue. A moral revolution! The old gentleman in the tortoiseshell spectacles looked at his companion. He nodded significantly. "'We refuse to sanction these indentures,' said the old gentleman, tossing aside the piece of parchment as he spoke. "'I hope,' stammered Mr. Limpkins, "'I hope the magistrates will not form the opinion that the authorities have been guilty of any improper conduct on the unsupported testimony of a mere child.' "'The magistrates are not called upon to pronounce any opinion in the matter,' said the second old gentleman sharply. "'Take the boy back to the workhouse and treat him kindly. He seems to want it.' That same evening the gentleman in the white waistcoat most positively and decidedly affirmed not only that Oliver would be hung, but that he would be drawn and quartered into the bargain. Mr. Bumble shook his head with gloomy mystery, and said he wished he might come to good, whereunto Mr. Gamfield replied that he wished he might come to him, which, although he agreed with the beadle in most matters, would seem to be a wish of a totally opposite description. The next morning the public were once again informed that Oliver Twist was again to let, and that five pounds would be paid to anybody who would take possession of him. End of chapter 3